Hello everyone. I think hopefully that's given uh, enough people time to come in. My name's Carmen de Cruz. I'm one of the trustees at Conway Hall and it's my absolute honour to have you all here today. Um, this is really exciting. Um, the Thinking on Sunday talks have been running um, for a very long time, nearly 100 years. Um, so Conway Hall is the oldest surviving free thought organisation in the world and is the only remaining ethical society in the United Kingdom and our home is at Conway Hall in central London, which sadly we can't go to at the moment because of the coronavirus and the lockdown, uh, which is such a shame. Um, but we're a secular humanist charity promoting human reason, secular ethics and philosophical naturalism as the basis of our morality and decision making. If you like what you see here today, please do donate to us. I'll put a link into the chat. Um, and uh, oh, I've just been spotlighted. That's exciting. Um, yeah, uh, please do donate. And you can also sign up for membership on our website. Um, so yes, I'll put links down at the bottom. And um, the format of today is we'll have me do a very quick introduction. And then our speaker is Jeff White, who I'll intro in a second, followed by a Q&A at the end where you can ask any question about the topic uh, that he's going to talk about. Um, the Q&A chat is slightly different to the regular chat. So if you hover your mouse at the bottom of the screen, you'll see an item pop up that says Q&A with two chat bubbles in the logo. So if you just type your question into there and then I can unmute you for the Q&A and then you can ask it. Um, if you're not sure about that, you can also just private message me and then um, I'll unmute you after that as well. So without any further ado, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Jeff White. Um, you know all about this talk because you will have booked online that his talk is called Crime.com from Viruses to Vote Rigging how hacking went global um, you can also buy a copy of his book from our website and see more details about how to follow him online but anyway jeff uh, welcome today thanks for uh, thanks for having me oh, i've just got the unmute myself button there we go um so yep yeah, good afternoon uh, everybody uh, and thanks for uh, being with us here on the sunday afternoon it's really good to be here um i'm jeff white um i'm an investigative journalist and i've covered technology for among others bbc news Channel 4 News uh, and the Sunday Times, and I'm the author of, of a book called Crime.com, um, which is basically everything you ever wanted to know about cybercrime um, reduced into one uh, neat, handy book. Um, the reason I wanted to write it was, uh, I've covered this stuff for about 10, 15 years, mostly cybercrime is the technology stuff that I cover. And there were just these incredible stories, these remarkable stories, of, of cybercrime, and partly because they're, they're increasingly important stories. I mean, at the stage where uh, hackers are breaking into political parties and changing the results of elections, that's a significant story. We have to get across that as a society. But put the important stuff to, to one side for a second. These stories are just incredible, fascinating tales. You know, how these hacking gangs work, how they break into places. How do you break into a power station and turn off the light? How do you break into a political party and change their votes? How do you break into people's bank accounts and steal a life savings? There's an incredible amount of innovation uh, and ingenuity involved in these cyber crimes. And they're bonkers stories. And it annoyed me that no one had told these stories to the public in a way that they could, they could understand, first of all, more importantly, perhaps that they could they could understand and be entertained by and find engaging and compelling and exciting. And most importantly of all, that they could learn something from. And these stories are out there, you know, they're in technical reports and, and, and expert testimony and criminal complaints and indictments. But to bring all of those together in a way that you can actually just read as a bedtime book was something that I really thought was worth doing. So that's what I've tried to do in the book. I've tried to pull together all of the best stories uh, of the history, really, of cybercrime, the modern history of cybercrime. Um, and that is what the book uh, looks like. Um, I'm going to tell you my favourite story from the book uh, over the next 45 minutes. I know we're not supposed to, authors, we're not supposed to have a favourite chapter of the book. Um, they're all good. They're all fantastic. Um, but I, I do. This, this is my favourite chapter. And the reason I love this is it's almost like, imagine somebody's watched a Hollywood bank heist film. And, you know, like all the classic bank heist films, they all run to a pattern. There's all things in cut. So Reservoir Dogs, The League of Gentlemen, you know, Ocean's Eleven, Truly Madly Deeply, uh, Three Colours Blue, all the big bank heist films, they all have certain things in common. And it's almost like somebody's watched one of those films and gone, let's do that in cyberspace. And then they've gone ahead and actually done it. So I'm going to be covering with you folks uh, how to steal a billion dollars. Actual amounts may vary. Your capital is risk. Jeff White is not regulated by the Financial Services Compensation Scheme. So if we're going to steal a billion dollars, 
we have to go to wherever billion dollars is. And that, of course, is mostly banks. So we're going to break into a bank. And not just any bank, specifically, we're going to break into this bank right here. <clears throat> that, ladies and gentlemen, is Bangladesh Bank. It's the national financial institution. Somewhere in there, they have access to billions and billions of dollars. And we want some of it. So we're going to get in. Question one, how? We'll have a look. There's a big fence across the bottom. It's got barbed wire on it. There's probably a gate there somewhere, though. Behind the gate, there will be uh, security staff, probably armed, uh, very, very highly trained to protect the bank. We can probably get past them, though. Maybe we could dress as FedEx delivery people and trick our way in. But then we'd have to get to the vault where they store where the money is. And let's face it, somewhere between one and the other, we're going to get caught. And we might get shot or very likely we'll just get arrested and convicted. I don't know about you, I don't fancy our chances there at all. But have another look at that building. Look at all those windows. Dozens and dozens of windows. And behind every single one of those windows, there's a person sitting at a desk, perhaps a bit bored, with a computer that's connected to the bank's systems. Now those employees, and they're probably not armed, and they almost certainly don't have the kind of security training of the guys at the front door. So, are we going to go into the front door and tackle the security guards, or are we going to try and target the folks sitting behind those windows? Which do you think is easier? Congratulations, you have just learned lesson one of cybercrime. People think cybercrime's about the kit and the code and the tech, and it partly is. But the most important cybercrimes, the most impactful cybercrimes, and the best cyber criminals, the best hackers, they understand the kit and the code, but more importantly, they understand people. They know how people work. To be a good hacker, to be the best hacker, you need to understand people's desires and their fears, and you need to play on them to get what you want. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna go behind those windows and we're gonna reach out to those employees and we're gonna try and manipulate them to let them get us into the bank. How? <clears throat> well, usefully, every one of those people is probably going to have something that's increasingly ubiquitous uh, in the world. You're probably using it right now, some of you, cheeky. You are using email. And email is the way that we're going to target the employees sitting behind those windows. That's exactly how computer hackers broke into Bangladesh Bank here. This is the 29th of January, 2015. A bunch of employees at Bangladesh Bank, the building we just saw, received this email. So it's going to addresses at bb.org.db. And it's coming from that email address there, yardgen at gmail.com. Remember that address. It'll come in useful later on. The email said simply this. I am Ras Al Alam. I am extremely excited about the idea of becoming part of your company and hoping that you will give me an opportunity to present my case in further detail in a personal interview. Here is my resume and cover letter. And there is a link where you can download Rasal's CV. I like Rasal. He's got chutzpah, hasn't he? He's got moxie. He's going straight in and he's asking for a job and he's attached his CV. And sure enough, a few employees at Bangladesh Bank clicked to download the CV and had a jolly good read. Of course, Hidden within the CV was a computer virus, and at least one of those employees in Bangladesh Bank got infected. Boom, we've broken into the bank. Well done. Have we, though? Think about who's receiving that email right there. It's going to be somebody working in, I don't know, HR. That's who gets the CVs, isn't it? So we haven't really broken into the bank. We've broken into the computer of somebody who works in HR. That's no good. We want money. We want to get through to the computer where the money is. So the hackers have a number of challenges. Challenge number one is this person in HR who's opened that email and been infected, what if they turn their computer off at night and then on again the next morning? Is your virus still going to be there the next morning? So that's job one of the hackers. They used a piece of software called Nest Egg. I love these software names. They're brilliant. Nest Egg keeps the virus running on the computer even when it's switched off and on again. This is what's called persistent access in the trade. Next thing the hackers are going to have to do is communicate with the virus computer. So they're going to be able to have to send instructions into that computer and have the computer send information out. Now, if that gets spotted by the bank, it's game over. So the hackers dug a tunnel under the bank in digital form. They created what's called an encrypted backdoor into the bank. And they did this using a software thing called MacTruck. Then they want to get from the HR computer to the computers that matter, the ones that have the money. 
So they start spidering out from that computer. Which other computers is it connected to? Can we connect to another computer? And hey, there's some passwords on this computer. That'll get us onto that computer over there. They bounce out through the network. This is what's called privilege escalation. And to do this, they used a piece of software called Sierra Charlie. So suddenly, the hackers are spidering out through Bangladesh Bank, working out what's where and who's connected to who. And as they did this, the hackers found out something really interesting about Bangladesh Bank. You see, not all the bank's money was in Dhaka, the capital. The bank has accounts at other banks around the world, including this one here. That is the New York Federal Reserve Bank, the famous New York Fed. Bangladesh Bank's got an account there. It's a dollar reserve account. So basically, if, if Bangladesh wants to pay another country or somebody else in dollars, they don't have to change it into dollars and then they can just transfer the dollars straight out of that account. There's a billion dollars sitting in Bangladesh Bank's account there in the New York Fed. And the hackers set out to steal every last red cent of it. Now, in order to do so, they've got an advantage because they've broken into Bangladesh Bank. So they're sitting inside Bangladesh Bank's computers. They can issue commands that will look like they've come from inside Bangladesh Bank. So all they need to do is to tell the New York Fed to start transferring money. And the New York Fed will think that the command has come from Bangladesh Bank. And to do this, the hackers used a piece of software called Swift. Now, you've probably not heard of Swift. Most people who don't work in the bank industry haven't. But it's a piece of software that's sitting in loads and loads of banks. It's almost ubiquitous in banks around the world. What this does is it's inter bank transfer system. So if one bank wants to send a million dollars to another one, it's swift that they use to issue that instruction to get the, uh, get the thing done. So the hackers are going to use swift to get the New York Fed to move money from Bangladesh Bank's account in the New York Fed out to accounts that they control. In order to do this, they're going to have to change and manipulate the code that sits behind swift. Now, in the films, computer code is it's always the same. It, it's green text on a black background, scrolling up the screen incredibly fast, usually typed out by a, a young boy in a hooded top, sitting in a basement, possibly his mother's basement, uh, occasionally saying things like, I've got the mainframe and stuff like that. Real life is slightly different. I'm going to show you, but real life is actually more interesting for my money. I'm going to show you the swift code that they use. I'm going to actually show you the computer code. Now, it is going to be code, so if you're not a techie, don't worry, it's going to look like gibberish at first, but it's all right. You, you can follow it through, and, and believe me, if I can understand this stuff, you can understand it. So this is the Swift code that they were hacking. Again, it looks like a jumble of letters and numbers. Who knows what that means? Well, let's take it line by line. That first line there, that simply is some kind of important check. Have you used the right password? Are you logging in from the right computer? Are you in the right time zone, the right IP address? Some, something to say that, are you the person who's actually authorized to make these transfers, to move money out of Bangladesh Bank's account at the New York Fed? Line two, if you fail that check, go to the failed line below. And the failed line below simply is this one. It just says, you've not passed the checks, you're not the right person, no money for you, jog on bucko. So, the hackers realize, and by the way, if you don't fail the check, you go to this line, success. You're able to make the transfers. The hackers realize, of course, that the key line is line two. That's where you fail the check. And if you fail the check, you get kicked out. So the hackers changed it. They replaced that line two with this, 90 NOP, 90 NOP. What does that mean? Do nothing, do nothing. So you never get to the line that asks whether you failed the check and therefore, you never fail the check, and that way, you're always successful. With those lines of code, the door to a billion dollar bank vault swung open. That, my friends, is beautiful. It's not good, <laughs> but it's beautiful. The soul of hacking, the spirit of computer hacking, whether it's done for good reasons or bad reasons, is simply this. It's to do the minimum amount of work you need with the code to do the maximum result. Eight bytes was all they changed in that code. They isolated exactly the right part, the key to the lock, and they made a minimal change, and that was it. Suddenly, they were in, and they could make transfers of up to a billion dollars. But we're not quite out of the woods yet. In the corner of Bangladesh Bank's branch back in Dhaka is this, which is, of course, the HP LaserJet 400 series. I know, I'm a massive fan myself. The DPI settings alone are worth a weekend's browsing. So that printer right there has one job, and it's this. It's gonna print out 
records of all the SWIFT transfers that are made. So if somebody logs in, uses SWIFT, transfers some money, wherever it is, whether it's in New York or, or whatever, any other bank account that, that Bangladesh has got, that print is going to print out a little piece of paper that says this was the transaction and so on. Well, that's going to be a dead giveaway, isn't it? <laughs> if somebody walks in and finds a stack of SWIFT transfer uh, printouts on that printer, it's game over. So the hackers broke in to the printer software and changed it so that it just printed out blank pages. Which, when I say it's like somebody's watched a Hollywood bank heist film, you know there's a bit in the heist film where they've got CCTV on the bank vault and then the, the criminals put like a loop of tape on the CCTV to make it look as though the vault is permanently empty. It's the same thing. They managed to basically hide their tracks, spraying over the CCTV cameras. And with that, the hackers were ready to start work. They lined up 36 transactions totaling $951 million, pretty much every last red cent that was in that New York Federal Reserve bank account that Bangladesh Bank had stashed away. Uh, now, you know, the, the, going back to the bank heist plot, there's always a bit in the heist where something goes wrong. Uh, so the way the heist movies work is, is that they, they show you how the heist is going to work. So they always do a practice run in like a barn or a warehouse and they've, they've got the vault all marked out. And there's a guy with a stopwatch going, too slow. Uh, and then they do it for real. And then when they do it for real in the film, something goes wrong. So you, like one of them drops a spanner um, and there's a really loud noise. And the next shot is usually an aging security guard with a torch and a dog going, ah, what was that buster? Ah, probably nothing. And then they, then they keep going. Same thing happened here. Of the 36 transactions, uh, 35 of them, you see, you see, with Swift, you can't just say transfer $950 million to Jeff White. You have to say transfer it to Santander Bank and then Santander Bank transfers it on uh, to the payee. In 35 of those transactions, the hackers forgot to specify the intermediary bank. And so they all got declined. And you can imagine the hackers go, fuck it, put it to quick, to get, get them through again. But eventually they got the transactions sorted out and the, the money started to fly out of the New York Federal Reserve bank account. Now, if you're going to do a bank job, you want to give yourself the maximum amount of time. Uh, so obviously for most people, that's going to mean doing it on a weekend. Or you could try a bank holiday weekend, which gives you three days. These guys went two steps further. This is brilliant. You're going to love this bit. It's fantastic. Okay, so in Bangladesh, the working week runs from Sunday to Thursday. So your weekend days are Friday and Saturday. So the hackers started moving the money at 8.36 p.m. on the Thursday, knowing that the bank will be minimally staffed if staffed at all from Thursday to, to, to Sunday. But think about where the money is. The money's in New York, where it's 9.36 a.m. So New York starts actioning the transactions. So the hackers have all day Thursday, New York awake, Bangladesh asleep. Friday, New York awake, Bangladesh asleep. Saturday, New York and Bangladesh asleep. Sunday, Bangladesh awake, New York asleep. And guess where the money ends up? $80 million of that money ends up here in the Philippines. Guess what Monday the 8th of February 2016 is in the Philippines? Bank holiday, Chinese New Year. The hackers gave themselves five days to get all of this done. They played three time zones to their advantage. We only get a five day holiday when a member of the royal family gets married or dies. They engineered a five day bender to get this money out of there. Absolutely remarkable. Now, um, $81 million of the money, as I say, ends up here. I went to the Philippines, by the way, to research this story. Um, and so that I took that picture. This is the RCBC branch in a place called Makati, which is in Manila, the capital of the Philippines. And what you can't see frustratingly on the photograph is behind the doors, the glass doors at the front there, there's a, a, a bored looking security guard with an enormous pump action shotgun. Um, and I did look at that and I thought, well, you know, you couldn't really come up with a better analogy of sort of old school security versus new school crime. It doesn't matter how many shotgun shells you have. You, you were never going to stop the crime that was about to happen at this particular bank branch. The money, the $81 million, flows into four bank accounts set up at that branch the year previously. And there's some dispute over how those uh, uh, bank accounts got set up. They certainly weren't regular bank accounts and they were a bit suspicious, but nothing happened with them for a year. So nobody really noticed. And then suddenly, 8th of February, 2016, those accounts are multi-millionaires. 20 million here, 20 million there, 10 million there. Money's just flying around. One account gets set up, 13 minutes later, it has $22 million in it. Uh, they moved the money out of the bank. Some of it got changed into pesos, got paid back into the bank. 
at one stage, it seems the people running this operation decided they wanted to move the money out of some money out of the bank in cash. But then they realized there wasn't enough cash in the bank to, to do it. So they got more cash from another branch. It arrives at the RCBC one here, the one in the photo. It's loaded into a cardboard box. I'm not kidding. A dark gray Lexus saloon pulls up outside that branch. The box is loaded into the car and the car drives off with it. Now, you would have thought lots of this would be caught on the bank CCTV, but guess what? It was out of operation on Monday, the 8th of February 2016, so none of this was caught on CCTV. This is what's called in the bank, in the, in the money laundering trade, layering. You are trying to mix the money around. You're trying to, it's like the three card Monty thing where you try and guess which cup the ball is under. You're trying constantly to move the money around and mix it with, with clean money. But if you're good as a forensic investigator, you can still track where the money goes. Uh, you can add up the bank accounts, you can, you can trace it minute by minute. Up until this point, the people on the trail of the hackers can still trace where the money goes. What the hackers are looking to do now is to break the chain of traceability. So it's the same as uh, in, a, in the Western films, the cowboy films, where the cowboy's being tracked uh, and he wants to sort of throw them off the scent. So he and his horse go into a stream and then they walk around in the stream and then they exit later. So you can't, you know, the footsteps go into the stream and you've no idea where they come out. The, the, the hackers, the money launderers in this case, are looking for a stream in which to wash their footprints. And they found it at this place here. This is called the Solaire Casino. It's one of the uh, big casinos, luxury casinos uh, uh, in Manila. Gambling's huge uh, in Manila. Um, loads and loads of gamblers. A lot of Chinese gamblers come down there to, to, to play. Um, when I went over there, I stayed, being a freelancer, I stayed in the cheapest hotel I could find, which is this enormous sort of 60-story place uh, nearby the Solaire, actually. And in the morning, if you wanted to leave the hotel, you had to get out the door by, by 8 o'clock, 8.30, because by 9, the lifts were just full of people going down to lobby, into buses, bus to the casinos, and that was it. Uh, it's really, really popular uh, in the Philippines. Now, obviously, this is the Solaire Casino. Uh, it, it's a high net worth environment, lots of money sloshing about. Uh, you know, you're not allowed to take photographs, obviously, inside a casino, but no one told me that. So here's some photographs inside the casino. That's a gambling thing. Uh, I don't know. Um, here's some other people uh, gambling, just tables and tables and tables of those people just smoking uh, and gambling. It is hard to describe the opulence of a place like the Solaire Casino unless you've actually been in these kind of high roll environments. These are your shopping options at the Solaire, Bulgari and Prada, Bang & Olufsen had a, a, a shop around the corner. I know what you're thinking. Were the toilet rolls tied into little triangles at the end? Yes, they were. I've been to some shishi places around the world, folks, uh, and I've stayed in some, some quite nice places, uh, courtesy of various institutions I've worked for, but it, the Solaire is the only place, the only place I've ever been to where when I went for a drink, the waitress came over and asked me if I wanted a little chair for my bag to sit on. And there it is, my bag on a little chair, because bags don't go on the floor at the Solaire Casino, darling. Um, this is the environment that we're dealing with, the Solaire. Now, of the 81 million that ends up in the Philippines, 30 million ends up there. 20 million ends up at another casino across town, which I won't lie to you, just looked a bit stabby. It did look like the kind of place that had a room in the back where you go in and then you just don't come out again, you know, filled with, you know, pliers and chainsaws and stuff. So I thought, well, I'm not going to photograph there. Um, so that's 30 million to the Slayer, 20 million to the other casino. Of the 80, that's the, it's the leaves. 30. So what happened to the other 30 million? Glad you asked. According to Filipino Senate investigators, the 30 million extra was paid to a Chinese guy called Wei Kang Zhu, who just buggered off with it. Never heard of again. So 30 million gets into the Solaire Casino. And this was the bit, this was one of the main reasons I, I went to the Philippines. I, I just couldn't understand why you would take stolen money to a casino. Um, it didn't make any sense to me because I don't gamble. I'm not a gambler. And so I had this image of casinos as being like you, you walk in and there's just this huge spinning wheel with numbers on it. And you say, I'll have number seven. And then they spin the wheel and, and it's not number seven. You lose all your money. That's, that's how I regard. So I've never really seen the appeal of gambling. You know, if, you, if I have money, I'd like to spend it on, well, sweets mainly like that, you know, because then you've got something you can actually I've just never seen the appeal of gambling. And I couldn't understand as, 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 a, as, a, as a thief, as a money launderer, how it works. The risk of just losing all your money uh, uh, seemed uh, too extreme to me. What I didn't understand is 
That's not really how casinos work. It's certainly not how casinos work if you have $30 million. So number one, the casinos in the Philippines were not at this stage regulated by money laundering regulations. So you could walk into that casino with 30 million in your back pocket and no one would ask a question about where you got it from. That's changed after this particular incident. The other thing about this is the gamblers who went there with the stolen money, they weren't playing the wheels and the casino tables among the hoi polloi. They had their own private room. So if you walk into a casino like the Solaire and you've got tens of millions of dollars to spend, you can say to them, look, can I have a private room? I'm gonna bring my buddies in, we're gonna gamble $30 million. By the way, I'd like free drinks. And the casino will say, hell yeah, because they know they're gonna make a large uh, amount of money off the back of the gambling that you're going to do. These are called junket rooms. And the reason these work really well for uh, money launderers is um, you, you, you get to control the environment. So you're in this one room, Everybody who's in there are people that you control, they're all the gamblers you know. You get special chips that only work in that room. So if somebody wins or loses, they can't just walk off with the chips. All the chips have to stay in that room. So as a money launderer, this is a really good environment. You can control what's going on in that room. The other thing that's really important is they're not just playing the big spinning wheel games, the ones that I know of, they're playing Baccarat. Baccarat's really important. Like everything else in this story, incredibly precisely engineered. The reason Baccarat's important is there's only two things to bet on. You bet on the player or you bet on the banker. That's, that's the two outcomes in Baccarat. So already it's easier to manage than the whole big spinning wheel thing. Uh, number two, if you're really good at Baccarat, you can make back about 90% of what you put in. So the house still gets up to 10%, but you, you get back 90. Now for a money launderer, that's really good odds. A lot of the time in money laundering, you're losing uh, 30 to 40 percent might be considered quite good, you know, up to sort of 60 percent you could lose uh, as a result of the money laundering. So to get back 90 percent, that's really, really good. But in order to do it, you have to play slowly and you bet a little bit at a time. If you take your 30 million in, you stick it on the first back or out game you play, you might lose the whole lot. So over time, the guys who are running the money through this casino, they bet a little bit at a time and then they make side bets and counter bets and hedge bets and they're controlling very carefully who's betting what. And so the money is sloshing across the tables and back and forth. Now for an investigator, this makes it extremely difficult because they can trace the 30 million in to the Slayer Casino, but then the money's been bet and gambled and won and lost over the tables and then money is being moved out to the other side. Connecting the one side with the other side is almost impossible. This is the stream in the cowboy film. They found somewhere to wash the money through. Now, in order to do this, as I say, you need to play relatively slowly. And it took them a month to bet the $30 million. Now, you're probably thinking at this stage, hasn't Bangladesh Bank rumbled what happened? Hell yeah, Bangladesh Bank rumbled it pretty much the day they all got back to work on the, on the Sunday. Even by the Saturday, they were starting to ring alarm bells. But Bangladesh Bank starts making furious calls to the New York Fed. And of course, it's Sunday in New York. And then by the time they get through to New York on the Monday, they realize it's the Philippines. And you ring up the Philippines, but it's a few hours ahead. And it's a bank holiday. So by the time they get through to the right people at the Philippines and they put a stop order on the money, the money is gone. I think Bangladesh Bank got back about 16 million of the money in the end. But that's nowhere near the amount that actually got stolen. And this is what annoys me about this. People say, oh, well, you know, cybercrime, it's a, it's a white collar crime, it's a victimless crime, isn't it? it's just money, you know, who really sort of cares about the money? Well, think of it this way. During the period of time of the Salaire Casino there that the money was being gambled, Bangladesh was hit by a, a cyclone, a frequent occurrence in Bangladesh. Cyclone Ryo uh, wiped out a whole area of, 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 of crops, uh, of, lively, of livestock. It wiped out the livelihood of many, many people uh, in Bangladesh. And there was an estimate afterwards of the amount of crops and livestock that had been lost in that one cyclone. It added up to $30 million. Exactly the same amount that was bet and lost in Soler Casino. Now, people say cybercrime is a victimless crime. For the people who were rendered homeless, for the people who lost their livelihoods, for the people who no longer have the cattle and livestock they were reliant on, they could have used $30 million right then. But that money wasn't there because it was being frittered across the tables in a casino halfway around the world by a bunch of criminals. Now, earlier on, I told you that they went after $951 million. And I've told you that $81 million ended up in the Philippines. Question, where's the other 870 million? Glad you asked. So of those 32 other transactions, 20 million was on its way here. 
This is the Shalika Foundation. It's a charity based in Sri Lanka, and it's run by this woman, Shalika Pereira. She is a budding politician. She was hoping that the charity would sort of burnish her philanthropic credentials. Uh, and she started working with a whole bunch of donors. And she was very interested this time in cows, particularly this set of cows. This was a dairy farm project in Matale, which is a couple of hundred miles away from Colombo, the Sri Lankan capital. Uh, and Shalika Pereira was trying to get money together to get this dairy project off the ground. She'd been working with a couple of fixers, a Sri Lankan fixer, and a Japanese fixer who had links into Japan and they were getting big money, some donations of millions from Japan. And one day, the Sri Lankan and Japanese fixers say to Shalika, we've got good news. You're gonna get the money for this dairy project. $20 million is gonna be donated. And as evidence, they showed her this letter. This letter came from uh, an organization called JICA, JICA. This is the Japanese International Cooperation Authority. It's a sovereign wealth fund on behalf of the Japanese government, and it goes around making philanthropic donations to various charities and so on. And it's not unfeasible that they've worked, uh, they would work with a Sri Lankan charity. And so the letter, sure enough, says, here's $20 million. It's coming to you for this dairy product, uh, dairy development project. Now, looking a bit more closely at the letter, there were some giveaways of the fact that maybe this wasn't on the level. So, for example, the word electrification is spelt wrong, and I'm not entirely sure upgradation is even a word. Second page of the letter had a picture of some banknotes tied together with a ribbon, not entirely commensurate with a sovereign wealth fund wielding billions of dollars of money. Uh, and on the last page, uh, nothing can be compared to the wealth from sale of milk and milk products, a sentiment with which I'm sure we can all agree. So, of course, the money is not coming from the JICA. They had no idea any of this was happening. The money was coming from the computer hack on Bangladesh Bank. 20 million of that money from the New York Fed was going to be sent to this Sri Lankan charity. Somebody in Sri Lanka, in a bank called Pan Asia, saw the transaction coming through. They saw the 20 million coming through to this charity and they thought, it's quite a lot of money, 20 million. Let's query it. So they sent it back and they sent it back to Deutsche Bank, who were another intermediary, another link in the chain. Deutsche Bank looked and realized that there was uh, a spelling mistake, that instead of sending it to the Schlieke Foundation, it had been made out to the Schlieke Foundation. Alarm bells started to ring. They sent it back to the New York Fed. I don't know what the reaction was there, but I suspect it started with S and ended with T and had four letters. And they reversed all the remaining transactions. So the 870 million didn't go through. So the hackers got away with $81 million. Not a bad haul. I just want to look at the timeline of what happened here. So January 2015, that dodgy email, the Rasal Alarm email, that arrives in January 2015. By March, the hackers had wormed their way in with all those different types of software and they'd wormed their way around the bank and they were ready to make the transactions. They'd open a back door into Bangladesh Bank. But it's February 2016 when the heist actually takes place. Look at that gap. That's hugely risky. Think of it. You've hacked into the bank. You've got an active back door into the bank. You can make the transactions now and then you wait for a year. Anything could have happened. Bangladesh Bank could have realized it was hacked. Bangladesh Bank could just have randomly decided to get some new computers and upgrade its IT, move location. Anything could have happened to shut the hackers out. Why? Why did they wait a year? Well, think about what happens during that year. It's May 2015 when the fake accounts are opened in Manila that the money's going to be transferred into. And it's January 2016 when that Sri Lankan charity, Sri Lanka Pereira's charity, is told to expect the $20 million for their dairy project. The hackers spent a year lining up the escape routes for their money. They spent a year working out a global network of accounts and escape routes they were going to channel the money through. And it's possible they've been working on things for even longer than that. Because a Sri Lankan charity started working with its Japanese fixer in October 2014. If that person is a link in the chain, it's possible the charity had been groomed for more than a year by the time the money went through. That is the story of Bangladesh Bank. This is all of the others. Now, apologies, it's a bit of an eye bleed of a slide. I'll talk you through it. Left-hand side's the date, then the name of the bank, then the country, then the amount they tried to steal. And over at the right-hand side is the attribution, the source of, of my information. Now, in some cases, I've added two and two together and I've got four. So the top one there, a security firm called Symantec, talked about a swift software attack on an Ecuadorian bank. 
and sure enough, Banco del Ostro in, in Ecuador talks about $12 million being lost in, in a similar attack. So I'm adding two and two together to get four. But in terms of adding up, I'll save you the effort. That adds up to $1.2 billion. I just want to talk about the last case there because um, I'm, I'm really, I'm kind of annoyed that this, it was sort of breaking by the time I got the book together. And I, but but it's, it's, it's an absolutely incredible case. So that's Cosmos Bank in India, $13.5 million gets taken out of there. Now, um, what's remarkable here is the hackers did the same thing as they did at Bangladesh Bank. They broke in, they got hold of the Swift software and they, they transferred money out using Swift. But then they realized, <coughs> excuse me, that they had access to the cash point software in the bank. Now you may not know this, but when you put your card into a, into a cash point, there's a, a communication happens across the world so that the bank you put the card into sends an encrypted communication to your bank and says, Jeff White's just put his card in, is he good for the money? And the bank, my bank says yes and sends an encrypted yes back. And once a handshake is done, I can then take money out of the cash point and the two banks will settle up later. This is why you can go to any cash point in the world and insert your card subject to a hefty fee. Um, now, it, what this meant for the hackers was they broke into Cosmos Bank in India. But what it means is anybody anywhere in the world can put a card into the machine, seeming as though it's come from Cosmos Bank. And, and the bank will communicate with Cosmos and say, is this person good for the money? Can I give And the hackers at Cosmos just say, yes, <laughs> fantastic, yes. This is what's called in the trade jackpotting, because you put your card in the machine, jackpot. According to the United Nations investigations into this, Across a course of three days, one weekend, a long weekend, in 29 different countries around the world, 100,000 transactions were made to extricate $3 million in three days. That's remarkable. And what's most remarkable about it isn't actually the hacking. Think about it. 29 different countries, 100,000 transactions. You've got to be having a team of, well, let's say minimum five, to, to do it. You've got to go on all the cash points, you know, you, you can't arouse too much suspicion. So that's 150 people. So you've now got 150 dudes around the world walking around with literal stacks of banknotes adding up to $3 million. What are they going to do? FedEx it? How do they get back to the person who actually did the hack in the first place? Where does this network of people meet? Oh, and the other problem is, if you've got a guy, particularly in, in places like India and Bangladesh, they've withdrawn the cash. It's just a lot of money in these countries. How do you stop them just walking off with it? Well, because this is a criminal network, your only recourse is violence or the threat of violence. So it's not just that you've got five uh, blokes in that particular country withdrawing cash. You've got to have somebody enforcing on them and saying, you can't walk away with that money or we'll do you harm. Who's doing that? Where are these networks getting together? How do the computer hackers work with the money launderers, work with the muling gangs? Somewhere, is there like a gentleman's club where they all meet together? I'd love to tell you I have the answers to it, but I don't. Maybe that's the next book. But you're not thinking of how. You're not thinking of how all of these $1.2 billion worth of thefts happened. You're wondering who, who's behind it. And that I can answer. It's this guy. It's not just this guy. Uh, it, it's him and his team. This is a chap called Park Jin Hyok. Uh, according to the FBI, he is a member of a North Korean government hacking team called Lazarus Group. Uh, and they're called Lazarus Group because once they're in your networks, they don't die. Very hard to get rid of. There are some other names for Lazarus Group. Uh, they're the beautiful elegaic names. That's one of the other things I love about cybercrime. These, get, these gangs get christened. So, um, what was it? Stardust Columnar was the other uh, name for this gang. Hidden Cobra uh, was another name. Uh, and for some reason, which I, I still can't quite work out, and nobody seems to know, the US government has recently named this Lazarus group and renamed them as Beagle Boys. I have no idea why. Anyway, Park Jin Hyok here is apparently part of a North Korean uh, government cyber attack team. So the question is, if Mr. Park there is indeed part of a top secret hacking team for one of the most secretive governments in the world. How have I got his picture? I'd love to tell you this is because I'm a fantastic investigative journalist, but actually the truth is a bit more prosaic than that. Think back to the Bangladesh Bank job. There's the CB that came through. Remember the Rasal Alarm email? Remember I told you that it came from a Gmail address, yardgen at gmail.com, and I told you that would come in useful later in the story. Well, that's a Gmail address. And Gmail, of course, is owned by Google, or Alphabet, to give them their proper name. 
So if you're an FBI investigator and you're looking into this and you come across yardgen at gmail.com, what do you do? <laughs> Next step is you go to companies like Google with a warrant. And that's exactly what the investigators did who were checking on Lazarus Group. They went to, I think they had a thousand different social media accounts, Gmail accounts, Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, and they hit the, all of those accounts with warrants. And they started to piece something together that's really interesting. <clears throat> you see, if you're in North Korea and you want to hack things, it's a really bad place to be because North Korea's window to the internet is really small. So we talk about the internet as though it's this sort of ethereal thing, as though it's kind of in the cloud or whatever. It's, it's, it's physical. Our connection to the internet is physical. If you go to Cornwall, for example, at low tide, you look out on one of the beaches, you will see a, a pipe about this big. That is our fiber optic cable connection to the US. Pulses of tiny light go through those fiber optic cables. That's the internet. That's our connection. Please don't screw with it. Everybody watching Netflix will not thank you. Conway Hall will not thank you when their Zoom connection goes down. But think about North Korea. North Korea's links with the outside world are tiny and its physical fiber optic cable links are tiny. There are some going up across North China. There is apparently a joint venture with a Thai company called Star. I was told there was at one stage a connection across a rail bridge into Russia, but we're talking about tiny, tiny amounts of connections. So the number of IP addresses that North Korea has compared to us in the UK, it's tiny, it's a few thousand. And of course, they're some of the most surveilled connections in the world because it's North Korea. So if you want to hack from inside North Korea, that's a really bum idea. So when North Korean government people want to hack, according to the FBI, they are sent across the border to other countries, notably China, to do the hacking from there where they can merge with the crowd more easily. And that's exactly what happened to uh, Mr. Park. He was sent out to uh, China to do some hacking. And like any good future employee ahead of time, he sends his CV with a list of his skills and his picture using the Gmail addresses that the FBI started to investigate. So when they opened these addresses up, uh, they found uh, Mr. Park's picture. And that's how he ended up being, unfortunately for him, I do feel sorry for Mr. Park, the face uh, of the Lazarus group. Now, question is, why is North Korea breaking into banks and stealing money, if, according to the FBI, and indictments that's to be believed and the United Nations investigation? Well, it might be something to do with this. This is United Nations Resolution 2094. We're all familiar with it. I'm kidding. I'll just cut to the shortcut. This was restricting North Korea's access to transfers of bulk cash and the country's banking relationships. This came off the back of the missile testing that North Korea started doing uh, more aggressively under its new leader, Kim Jong-un. Uh, this is an attempt by the international community to turn off the money taps to North Korea. Now, faced with United Nations sanction 2094, which was passed in March 2013, in just over a year, Lazarus Group starts hitting up banks. Faced with international criminal sanctions, international sanctions on its money supply, North Korea simply hacked its way around it, according to the investigations of various security researchers uh, and the FBI. Now, don't worry, it's not all bad news. I've got some good news for you. Remember that slide I showed you with all the different banks <clears throat> and all the different uh, attacks, and it added up to $1.2 billion. Well, in Bangladesh Bank's case, they went for a billion and they got 81 million. So they're not always successful. So yes, they went after $1.2 billion, but what they actually ended up with, according to my calculations, is $122 million. Now that's not bad. And it's still $100 million or more going to, uh, apparently to a country which is the target of, uh, of international uh, financial sanctions. But it's nothing compared to what they wanted to get. Think back to the Bangladesh Bank case, for example. They went after a billion, they got 81 million to the Philippines, 30 million goes with some Chinese guy we never heard of again, that leaves 50 million, and then you've got to pay off all of the gamblers, and then you've got to pay off the people helping you move the money across the borders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. How much money actually ended up back in North Korea, if indeed it is that country behind it? Probably looked like thin pickings compared to the original aim. What computer hackers have been looking for is a way out of this physical moving money around the world scene, uh, which will lose you money on your money laundering. So the attrition rate is terrible on this. What computer hackers have been looking for is a way of getting 100% of the take, not losing any money to any intermediaries. And in 2017, uh, they got it. 2017 was when this message started arriving on computers uh, around the world. This was the WannaCry ransomware attack. You may know it hit the NHS disproportionately. Now, what happens when you get that screen is your files have been encrypted on your computer 
and the people who've scrambled those files and, and put the virus on your computer are charging you a ransom to get your files back. It's delightfully easy to explain ransomware. Now, the key thing about that is when you pay the ransom, if you pay the ransom, you're paying it in a virtual currency, in the Bitcoin currency. And the important thing about that is that the money goes straight back to the cyber criminal's wallet. That ransomware campaign and the ones related to it have fueled a cyber crime wave because suddenly the hackers who are losing money through the money laundering network are getting 100% of the take. And that is the next chapter uh, in crime.com, uh, which apparently is available, uh, as you said, heard, is available uh, from Conway Hall and all good bookshops and some bad bookshops as well. Um, I'll prattle on for a little bit. I hope you've uh, learned something. I hope you've enjoyed it. As I say, plenty more just amazing stories in the book. Uh, I'm very happy to take questions now on cybercrime, other aspects of tech. Uh, be great to hear from you. Thank you so much for your time. Hello, I hope you can see me now. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. That was absolutely fascinating. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah, whatever happened to just earning money the old time. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, that was really interesting. So um, if you've got a question for Jeff, um, there's a little icon down at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A with two little um, speech bubbles. Uh, that's what the icon looks like. So if you want to type in your question there, and then I'll unmute you, and then you can ask it. Um, also, I said I was going to put um, a link into the donate button, which I've forgotten to do. So I'll also do that, um, but I'll do that at the end. Uh, so if you do have a question, um, just pop it in the Q&A, and then I'll unmute you. Um, but yeah, Jeff, I have the first question, actually, while people are getting started. What did you leave out of the book? <laughs> what did I leave out of the book? Um, I think... In hindsight, um, one, of the, one of the big hacking forces, uh, China is a big um, country for hacking. So I have, I, it's, I've concentrated, Russia gets a lot of mention, North Korea gets a lot of mention, organized cybercrime gangs got a lot of mention. I've also covered um, the UK and the US uh, activity, GCHQ and the NSA, the Snowden documents, a little bit about Huawei, but I feel maybe I could have gone a bit more in depth into China. The thing is, because it's a story-led book and because the chapters are stories, you know, I was looking for the sort of Chinese case that, that's a really good story and I didn't quite get to it. And frustratingly, as I say, the Cosmos Bank story, the, the thing where they, cash, they, they jackpotted the, the cash point software, that there's a really great story to be told. Now, I may tell it in the future, but it wasn't quite there. Uh, and also there is actually a Chinese connection with, uh, according to the FBI, with the North Koreans in that um, there's a, there was a money laundering network set up by a couple of Chinese guys who were using... Um, cash cards and gift cards and stuff to move, move, move things around. An incredible case. So the problem with cybercrime is it's always evolving. And at a certain point with a book where you've just got to uh, uh, close things off. So, so that's, those are probably the bits that I, I'd still want to explore. Um, and I'm hoping, uh, I'd love to do another book and I'd love to do another book about, about money laundering and money muling. And I think that's maybe going to all go into there. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, so Graham has a question. Um, if you can unmute Graham. Hello, Sue, can you hear me? Yeah, loud and clear. Um, a very interesting talk. I really enjoyed it, Jeffrey. Can you hear me, Jeffrey? Yes, I can. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Oh, Thanks, great, yeah. Uh, my question is uh, perhaps a little obscure. I, I don't know what you think of it, but um, just, just something that cropped up in my mind as, as you, you was uh, going through the talk. Um, when you said um, that the um, Sri Lankan Bank actually got um, £16 million pounds back, um, uh, through through laundering uh, in mm. the end, in the end after it was all um, overshadowed and, and, and the hackers were caught and, and everything mm. went to the open. Yeah. Um, how, how do you think the money was transferred back into the bank? Did, did they get it in that in that sixteen million in, as whole? Because the, the question on my, my mind is, um, you know, um, the money had been spent by the hackers. Mm. So how was it actually reverted back to them for that sixteen million? Uh, the, yes, it gets quite. Tracking down the money, I mean, there's an amazing report by the Senate, the Filipino Senate. Um, and the problem with this is when, I think when they added up all of the amounts of money, the Filipino Senate found the discrepancy of several million dollars. So, so actually even just working out how much money there was, I've used 81 million and that's about right. Um, so, so the 30 million went into the Solaire and I, I think all of that pretty much got lost. The 20 million that went into the other casino was 
um, run through an intermediary. And as I understand it, as I can remember, the 16 million was clawed back from the intermediary. So in the Solaire, the money went in and I think was gone. In the other casino, some of the 20 million had gone into it, but some of it could be clawed back. Um, and, and yes, that was, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure that was a lump sum that was paid back uh, to Bangladesh Bank. I see. Thank you, Jeff. Pleasure. Cool. Thank you, Graham. Ooh, we've got a very shy audience today. Not yeah, they're, all, they're all terrified of cyber. Uh, imagine everyone. Yeah, yeah. Uh, if I ask this question, will it incriminate me in future? Uh -huh. <laughs> just in terms of, I mean, you know, on that subject of just people being, um, I, I've had some people who sort of said, you know, they, they found the book worrying or scary. And, and I guess that is sort of, it is crime. And I suppose people are right to be scared of it. But look, let's think back at what happened at Bangladesh Bank. You know, the casinos, could they have done more about it? Probably yes. The banks, could they have done more about it? Yeah. But like at the very beginning, what happened was simply an email arriving on somebody's work computer and somebody getting concerned about it and clicking on it. And that tactic of sending somebody a dodgy email with the right content at the right time to trick them into clicking on it, it is still, depressingly, that is still the number one tactic for cyber criminals. So you don't have to have sort of Snowden levels, Edward Snowden levels of cyber security sort of knowledge. Your, your inbox, I think people have this idea that your inbox is something friendly, you know, because it's yours, it's your inbox, it's your mates, your family who email you. You know, you need to start thinking about your inbox as being a front door to a very, very busy street. You know, anybody can shove anything in through, the, through your letterbox. And that's slightly the way we need to think about our, our, our email systems. And, and that will protect you from a lot of cybercrime. Same with clicking links in Facebook and Instagram and so on. It's just that, that, that thing of just think just a few seconds before you, before you click on the link. Mm, cool. Uh, so we now have a question for James. Uh, here we go. Hi. Hi, Jeff. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yes, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant talk. Thank you. Um, very quick question. Um, so, uh, what, what do you perceive the relationship to be between traditional cyber criminal groups and state-sponsored actors, if 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 one exists at all? Yeah, it's a it's a really good question, and um, one of the key. So, so in the book, I, I sort of didn't really address this, but I've tried to break things down into three groups. So there are, as you say, there's the organised crime gangs who've got massively into cyber crime. Um, there's a great cartoon I saw where there's a group of sort of, you know, baddies, kind of classic mafiosi sitting around a table. And one of them is saying, for health and safety reasons, we've decided to move into cybercrime. Um, and that, that is it. You know, it's a lot safer to, to carry out crimes or for the crime gangs anyway. They often feel it's a lot safer to carry out those, those cybercrimes. So organized crimes got into it. Um, there's also sort of growth of what I called hacktivist uh, areas, which is um, people are not necessarily hacking for profit, although there is a sort of crossover with that. Um, but they're, they're generally hacking for uh, for kudos, sometimes to make a make a fuss, sometimes to expose security weaknesses. And that group of people love playing with the media. They love manipulating or, or even sort of working symbiotically together with the media to make to make a maximum fuss. And then you've got the government hackers. You know, espionage has always always, always existed, but governments are increasingly putting funding into cyber attacks. In the UK, we have offensive cyber capability, i.e. we can hack into uh, targets if we want to. And there's a whole section of the book about how GCHQ operates on that, which is interesting. Um, previously, those three groups have been fairly separate. So, you know, if you got hacked, you could say, oh, it's hacktivists or it's a government or whatever. Increasingly, those groups are just merging together um, for a number of different reasons. The, the, the government hackers have realized they can learn from the hacktivists, they can learn media manipulation tactics. And we saw this obviously during the 2016 presidential election. There wasn't just computer hacking, traditional, there was also computer hacking with amplification on social media, the use of social media to either publicize the hack or, or, or to make the effect of the hack worse. Organized cybercrime gangs have again started, uh, their, their tactics are bleeding across into government operators. So some governments are using organized cybercrime gang tools, you know, bank hacking software, to hack into other governments. So when the government gets hacked into it, thinks, oh, well, it's a, it's a cybercrime gang, an organized crime gang, when actually it's a government. Interestingly, there was a report recently by the Intelligence and Security Committee in the UK who looked into Russian interference, into cyber attacks and cyber interference, and what, uh, interference generally. Um, and one of the things they made very early on, they made the point that there's a confluence between organized cybercrime gangs and uh, state operators, particularly in the Russian context. There's an amazing story about um, uh, a Russian, a young, really talented young, young Russian hacker who works out how to break into Yahoo. He worked out some trick to break into Yahoo email accounts. And Yahoo, still one of the you know, really big email providers. 
And he worked with, uh, according to US government investigators, worked with uh, an FSB officer to, to sort of milk this particular tactic he'd found. And there was this sort of symbiotic relationship between the two of them. So the answer to your question is absolutely, there, was a, there is now a huge crossover, partly to obfuscate who's doing the attacks so governments can pretend they're crime gangs and crime gangs can pretend they're governments and so on, but also just in terms of, of, of swapping and sharing of tactics and knowledge. And, and the, the WannaCry attack that I talked about that, that hit the NHS disproportionately, that ransomware attack, the genesis of that was really interesting. So the actual uh, piece of hacking software, the tool, the sort of code that did that was originally developed by the US government. Um, according to the president of Microsoft, it was the US government that developed that, that, that hacking trick. They lost it, somehow it got stolen uh, from the US government, it got leaked on the black market, on the underground. And the North Korean government, according to the US, picked that piece of software up and used it to create this ransomware campaign. So you have a system where there's a, there's a, there's a government develops the hacking software and the hacking tools, organized crime gangs steal it and make it available. And then another government picks it back up and inflicts it back on the world again. Just there's this, there's this increasing confluence between these things. The problem with that is, Organized crime gangs have quite a lot of money and resources, partly because they're making money out of cybercrime. Government has government money to put into this. When you've got government money and government time, there's a lot more resources now going into cyber. And if there is this crossover between governments and organized crime gangs, the government's time and money and resources potentially is going to end up feeding the organized crime gangs. And I think that's, that's one of the some more dangerous aspects, I think. Thank you. It really blurs the line between crime and not crime <laughs> mm, yeah yeah and also you know fake news fake news and, and disinformation as well bleeds into that's a sort of huge breaking area so all these areas that you could kind of separate espionage and cyber crime and, and disinformation they're all starting to kind of blur together it's it's a uh, can be quite confusing yeah thank you uh, next we have oliver with a question can you hear me yes can yeah. hear you. yes yes go ahead great great talk jeff really really good um I don't want to get too technical, but I'm always getting uh, invited or promoted virtual private networks to put in VPNs. Now you'd assume all these banks would have VPNs or better than VPNs. The implication of what you're saying is they actually don't offer really any useful protection against this sort of thing at all. Is that the case? Is it, are they worth putting in? It, yeah, I mean, for the for the non techie listener listeners, that, so this a VPN is basically a sort of um, it's like an encrypted tunnel. When I talked about the hackers, bear, you know, doing a tunnel underneath Bangladesh Bank, if I want to sort of protect myself, I can pay to. It's usually paid for. Some of them are free though. I can I can get a, an encrypted tunnel from my laptop here in my in my study, and it will. If I visit the BBC's website, it will set up a sort of encrypted closed encrypted tunnel so that people can't see that I'm visiting the BBC website or if I'm visiting some, some other more dodgy website. Um, and this, is, this has been seen as a way of, um, of, of protecting people and protecting, them, uh, protecting themselves. You may have seen also people use it sometimes to get around um, geographical blocking. So if you want to watch iPlayer uh, in the US, not that you should do this, but some people use VPNs uh, in that way. Um, yes, I mean, banks and, and institutions rely on them a huge amount. There is um, there's a couple of things about VPNs that people need to understand. So let's say I am a cyber criminal. I'm using a VPN to, to carry out the crime. If the, if the police find out that I'm using that particular VPN, they can go to that virtual private network provider and say, who did you provide this encrypted tunnel to? Because yes, my traffic to, to and from the BBC website is encrypted in, in this tunnel, but somebody's built the tunnel, somebody's provided the tunnel. And so the police can go to them. So it is a, a sort of point of failure. The other thing is, let's say a government or a bank is using a particular tunnel provider, a VPN provider. If another government wants to hack them, again, they, they can try and hack the VPN provider. They try and protect themselves, these tunnel providers, but they're still, they're still a target. And the other thing that's, that's, it's a new sort of thread of research this, but um, when I wanna you know, use my encrypted tunnel to visit the BBC website, I have to sort of press the go button on that encrypted tunnel. So I, I have to sort of, you know, en enable it and set it up and, and, and create the link from my laptop to the BBC website. Well, in the moments before you do that, in a few moments before you do that, you're, you're, you're not going through the tunnel, you're just connected to the bare internet. And so there's a lot of research by hackers about how to get in in the moments before that VPN uh, it, connection is set up. However, I will say this, one of the things about cybercrime is you've got to work out what your, what your risk is and who, you, who you're fighting against. 
Um, if you're a bank or a government, then yeah, you, you need to look at your VPN really carefully and address all the points I've just made. If you're a home user, if you're a domestic user, and, and you're using a VPN, it's still a good piece of security. So I think like domestically, we, you know, I think VPNs are a good idea and I think they're a good thing to use. But no, to answer your question, increasingly a VPN is something that you can't just install it and, and, and hope it protects you. And interestingly, during the coronavirus period, a lot of people working from home, right? If you're working from home and you work for a bank or government or whatever, again, you, often you're using a VPN. You know, your employer will say, right, log in using this thing and you set up an encrypted tunnel to your, to your business, to your workplace. Well, again, that's, that's proving a bit of an issue security-wise because so many places are relying on this. It's a single point of failure. So you might like pick up on VPNs. I think, they're, I think they're sort of the cutting edge of security. And particularly if we all keep working from home, I know hackers are sniffing around that and I know they're thinking if we can slip in around the VPN, if we can get into that encrypted tunnel or sneak behind it, we can get people's information, uh, uh, working, people working from home and so on. But, so as I say, for the moment, domestically, I think they're a good idea. But I, I, if I was an institution, I would not be relying just on a VPN and thinking my problems are over. Great, thank you. Is there any risk, well, can you talk a bit about the risk to individuals as consumers and people who just have our, you know, £250 saved up in a bank account, um, what the risks are for cybercrime uh, and the impacts on, like, just individual hmm. people rather than institutions and governments? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, um, I mean, you know, I say that the, the big crime wave has been, has been ransomware and, and Depressingly, the way this is still delivered a lot of the time is, you know, an email will arrive, it'll have a link on it or an attachment, or somebody will send, you'll get something on Facebook or something on Instagram or whatever, and it's got a link in it and you click it and, and you get infected. As I say, because the criminals get 100% of the money when, when, if you pay the ransom, you know, it, it, it's hard to overstate the amount of money they've made off of ransomware. Um, so the way that the criminals will often work, work is they'll do campaigns um, in the way that advertisers do campaigns, you know, they, they put an ad here and an ad here and then they see which one works better. Cybercriminal is exactly the same. They, they, they will do one ransomware campaign here and they'll do another ransomware campaign there and they'll kind of work out which one they get the most money from. One campaign, just one campaign of one type of ransomware, uh, they calculated got them $350 million. Um, and that was just, you know, less than a year to, to build up that kind of money. So that's 350 million bucks has gone into a criminal enterprise. And that's just one particular campaign. God knows how much they made across all of their different campaigns. So, you know, the one key thing you can do is look out for those links, look out for those attachments, because falling into the trap of ransomware is, 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 is certainly a risk. Um, uh, as for the rest, I mean, in terms, of, in terms of, you know, protecting ourselves, increasingly banks will ask you to use a thing called two-factor authentication, which you, well, many people know about. It's basically you get a code on your phone or you get a little card reader and that kind of thing. Again, worth doing that. However, the hackers, because this is an arms race, are already thinking about that. So, for example, with the code that's sent to your mobile phone, one thing ha hackers have started to try and do is what's called SIM swapping or SIM hijacking. Your, your phone has a SIM card that goes into it. And obviously, when you get the text message alert from your bank that authorizes you, it's going to come to your phone through the SIM card. What hackers are now trying to do is to phone mobile phone companies and try and take over somebody's account and effectively get the message sent to the hacker's sim card rather than to your sim card uh, and so when they try and log into the bank it, it's them that's going to get the authorization code so again with your phone it's kind of worth uh paying attention to that being a kind of sing you know a single point of failure if, you, if your phone goes and, and all your banking stuff is set up on the phone and the phone gets compromised that's a bit of, a, of an issue as well so it's it's you know i don't want to terrify people most people thank god will will, will never encounter cyber crime um, but as i say it's it, painfully easy just to make a little slip up and, and vigilance on your phone on your email account is probably the best way uh, best way around that thank you um, in the book do you talk about cyber crimes that are not financially related like different types of um crimes that perhaps are looking for information or um other other things that i can't think of <laughs> yeah 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 um uh, you know there's a whole chapter about about the disinformation and fake news threat and that, in a way that was one of the more difficult chapters to to write because it's, it's my industry it's the journalism industry and it's a really murky and difficult area to navigate because on the one hand journalists have always relied on uh, anonymous sources you know the sort of plate the, the plain brown envelope that you get in the newsroom is, is obviously a source of stories and I, I don't want a situation where 
we can't use anonymous sources and we can't use whistleblowers because obviously that's that's bad people need to be able to do that the problem is we're in a situation now where sometimes an anonymous source comes forward with some information uh, and I've, I've met anonymous, I've met sources who wanted to remain anonymous but were known to me what I don't think I've dealt with is a source who isn't even I don't even know who's generated the information but I get handed the information I think as journalists we have to treat that really with kid gloves because the issue is there have been instances where hackers contact journalists disguise their identity or don't give any identity at all give the journalists hacked information and then the journalists do stories off the back of it and the journalist might sort of say well yes but the story you know the information justified the story the problem is later on it's come out that the information was actually hacked by a government somewhere and the journalist then looks like they're doing sort of dirty work of of that government so i think Anonymous sources and that kind of information manipulation stuff is something we've got to really handle with kid gloves. Uh, and the other thing that's really interesting about the information manipulation stuff is, is it's getting really difficult to, to tell the, the sort of disinformation campaigns, the automated disinformation campaigns. So there was some really interesting work done on the, on the, um, uh, the Brexit campaign by the Oxford Internet Institute. And one of the things they looked at was Twitter and how Twitter was dealing with the Brexit campaign. And there was this idea that on Twitter there was automated software that was promoting Brexit and this was part of a sort of campaign. And they looked very deeply into it and did some really interesting research. And there were things that they found. So for example, there was a t-shirt manufacturer who would put out t-shirts with just logos on, slogans on them. And, and this t-shirt manufacturer had a piece of software that whatever was in the news, whatever was exciting and people were talking about, they would generate a t-shirt with that sort of slogan on it, that issue on it. And so when Brexit happened, of course, their software went, oh, people are talking about Brexit. Let's do a Brexit t-shirt. And you could you know, have a vote leave or vote remain t-shirt made. The, the bots, the, the sort of programmatic uh, automated Twitter accounts that were, that were looking at all the Brexit stuff, saw the t-shirts with vote leave on them, promoted them to their sort of followers and tried to flam them up. But then people, real, just normal, ordinary people who were you know, pro-Brexit, picked up on that, retweeted those things. And then the bots that initially were picking up on that picked up a bit more and you get this kind of mad cycle. So it's, it's quite difficult in some ways to kind of pick apart those disinformation campaigns. And I think, you know, the 2016 presidential election was really the high tide of like obvious balls out hacking a government to, to, to change things. And that really was as, as we've got so much information about that. I don't think we'll see the likes of that again. I think things are getting far more pernicious, far more difficult to spot. Uh, and that's really worrying because there's just suspicion now. When a, when a vote happens, there's always this possibility of, did the vote get hacked? Was information manipulated? And, and it just casts doubt. It casts doubt on the, re the results of elections, particularly close ones, mm -hmm. and, and the way media deals with them. And obviously, you know, 2020 election in the US, we can, we can look forward to more of that. <laughs> yeah, delightful. Um, we have a brilliant question here from an anonymous attendee. Um, how do cyber groups meet up and plan for a heist? Do they become friends somewhere and decide to do it? Do they mainly do it digitally or physically? It's a really, really good question. Um, and, and the answer I'm, I'm going to give is obviously going to be a partial answer because I, you know, not being part of um, those cybercrime gangs, uh, I'm not necessarily sort of privy to how, to how they meet. I mean, certainly, look, in the case of the Bangladesh Bank heist, the, the, the group of people who actually did the hack will almost certainly know each other and be physically in the same, you know, that there's a gang of people working. Um, the FBI investigation reveal the whole, you know, social media accounts set up by different people at different times. And one of the things investigators will do is they'll try and work out the personality, you know, who's doing what, how many people are we dealing with here? Uh, and so there's a whole sort of interesting kind of aspect to that. What, you know, you picked up on what I talked about in the talk is that's the people who do the hack. The people who are actually, you know, gambling the money in the, in the Philippines casino, they will obviously be being manipulated and run by and, and, and sort of, you know, managed by uh, another operative who is then handling that part of the operation. Um, somewhere out there, there are connections uh, being made. And particularly looking at North Korea, you know, it's had exercises before of, of, of you know, foreign operations. They're used to dealing in foreign countries. Uh, and so I presume they're quite good at making connections with people in those countries who can sort of help them out. So that's that particular example. What I have seen also, though, is um, instances of cyber attacks where one person has the idea, one or two people have the idea, and they get so far down the line and realize, well, actually, we can't quite finish this hack or can't quite pull this off because we don't know this particular piece of technology. So they will go to dark web forums and sometimes forums on the normal internet 
and they will start surfing about for, does anybody have the, you know, have this particular piece of knowledge? Can anyone help us with this particular issue? It probably won't say, um, by the way, <laughs> we're, we're about to use it to break into this organization, but they will fish around for people who have that same level of knowledge. Once they find them, they might pull them in and say, right, this is what's going down. This is, you know, we'll give you a share of the profits or a share of the, the, the data will loop you in. Um, there is also among um, the cybercrime gang uh, groups as well, uh, community as well as the technology community, there's a lot of share, there's a lot of open sharing. You know, there are forums on the dark web where I've seen people go on and say, I'm having trouble cracking these passwords. Can anyone help? And somebody will say, yep, yeah, I ran them through my machine. Here's the results. So again, it's not necessarily the case that you have to sort of pay people or recruit them to your gang. Sometimes you can just go out and appeal uh, uh, for, the, for the help. So that's generally how it works. However, the answer to your question might be that there's some bar they all hang out in <laughs> that I just haven't been into yet. And that that's where they, but I, yeah, so that's the, that's the most insight I can give you on that. Okay. Yeah. We're not cool enough to go to those clubs. <laughs> uh, next question is from David. I'll just try and unmute you, David. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hi there. Can I hear you? Oh, um, Oh, I, um, I sent my question in. Yeah, do you want to read it out or would you like me to? Um, yeah, um, well, it's two questions. Do you trust the well-known internet security companies, antivirus, firewall and so on? Mm. And also when companies have been dis defrauded, as you've described, do um, staff get disciplined or punished? Two, two, two really good questions. Um, the, the question about trusting the, the security companies. Um, I know a lot of the people who work at a lot of these companies and, and they are really fighting very hard to, to keep things safe and to make things safe. The problem they've got, particularly antivirus companies, is, is there's just this arms race. So, you know, keeping up with what the hackers do is one thing. But the hackers will be constantly making tiny, tiny, subtle changes to their viruses to try and sneak them through the antivirus software. I, I don't think it's a good thing just to rely on it. Again, it's like with the VPNs. I don't think installing antivirus software and saying, hey, I'm protected, really bad idea. Stuff will get through. Things will get through. And it's a classic thing. You know, the, the defenders have to be right every time. The attackers only have to be right once. So, uh, you know, I, uh, when you say, do I trust them? I trust them to do their job as far as they can. Do I trust them to protect me and to, for that to be a sort of, you know, blanket protection? Absolutely not. Uh, it's really depressing this, but we have to take this stuff into our own hands. Your government's not going to protect you. Your antivirus company's not going to protect you. Your employer's not going to protect you. I'm sorry, but look, we've got this great internet thing. We, we can do this. We can do virtual conferences. Conway Hall can do fantastic things. The cost of that, the fee we pay is we now have to sort of, you know, grab a bit of security w with our own hands and sort of, you know, take a bit of responsibility uh, uh, ourselves. So I think, you know, that that would be the answer to that. And in terms of do staff get disciplined? Um, well, um, the I think I'm right in saying that the heads of both Bangladesh Bank and RCBC, the bank in the Philippines, both lost their jobs. Uh, this, they were subject to record fines. They were both fined by the regulators and, and, and f pay, paid record fines. In terms of the employee who clicked on that email, now that's an interesting question. Do you discipline that person? I personally am of the opinion, and a lot of companies will do this. You, you, you may have worked for a company where they do what they call phishing tests. So they send out emails to all the staff. Uh, and if you're you know, stupid enough to click on it or, or, or clumsy enough to click on it, you, know, you, you, you get somebody saying, oh, you, you've done the wrong thing there. You have to go on this course about internet security and, and stuff. And look, that's not bad. That's not a bad way of doing it. Uh, and uh, you know, perhaps the person at Bangladesh Bank did get disciplined. But for me, that's only, you know, people respond to the stick and the carrot. You know, if you're giving them too much stick, it's not going to work. You know, you've got to give people the carrot. So what I'd hope is, you know, that as employees at places like Bangladesh Bank and others, as they get better at security and they pass those tests, and they do stronger passwords, you know, they can be sort of rewarded for that and told, brilliant, you've done a, a really good job there. The problem is, you know, people only get any reaction from the company when things go wrong. I think companies need to get better at, uh, at congratulating people as it goes along and saying, look, we've had another month without apparently had getting a breach we had another month where you've got great passwords you know well done to sort of encourage people along there's a huge debate actually in the security community about this there are some people in the security community tech security community who say employees should not have to worry about this stuff at all that's our job we are spoke and if we're not 
if they are having to worry about it, we're not doing our job properly. They should never see these viruses. They should never have to worry about clicking on things. And there's other people who say the employees are the last line of defense. We have to make them a security team, basically. We have to get them up to speed on security. The balance is probably somewhere in the middle, but, but what you put your finger on there is a live debate uh, in the security uh, community. Um, you know, I think probably the hero of the whole story is the person at Pan Asia Bank who spotted the 20 million and went, oh, this is quite a large amount of money. Um, so no, but good question and certainly issues that are kind of live in the community at the moment. Great, thank you. Uh, next question is from Graham. Hello there, can you hear me? Yes, yes I can, yes. Yeah, cheers. <laughs> There's been lots of talk about, um, in, in, in the talk you've, you've made, about um, uh, the actual hack itself, mm. but um, not so much into the investigation that the FBI took, took, took on to mm. um, try to uncover the, the masquerade. Yeah. So um, I just wondered, how, how will FBI learn from these mistakes? Yeah. And um, what... The story with the Bangladesh Bank uh, tale. The story actually starts in 2014 with the hacking of Sony Pictures Entertainment. Um, hackers broke in. There was a film that Sony were making called The Interview, um, which was a film about a couple of bumbling journalists who go to North Korea to interview Kim Jong-un and end up being part of an assassination attempt. Uh, needless to say, this did not go down well in North Korea. <laughs> they did not like that film one little bit. And so they, according to the FBI's investigation, started hacking Sony Picked Entertainment. From there, that rolled into an investigation into the WannaCry cyber attack that again was linked to North Korea. And from there, it rolled into the Bangladesh Bank uh, investigation. So this, this is morphing investigation. And the picture I showed you of Mr. Park Jin Hyok, the, the, the guy, um, came out of that investigation. The FBI has done an, a criminal complaint now against Mr. Park and others. Uh, and so that is full of, of, there's an incredible amount of detail in that report. And I've used it as, as a basis for quite a lot of that chapter. So the FBI are learning lessons. And look, you know, other companies can read that report and go, oh, well, I'm not going to do what Sony did, or I could, I could do something about that. Um, so so I actually, for my money, the, you know, much have issues with some of what the U US government does. The FBI's reports into cybercrime, and it's, it's attempts to say it's that person there, or it's that country there, and here's the evidence, have been really impressive. And it would be nice to see some of that stuff coming out of the UK uh, as well, you know, putting its money where its mouth is and sort of saying, look, here's our evidence. Um, so I think the FBI have been putting out, out decent stuff about that. The issue they've got, of course, is they've got a criminal complaint out against uh, Park Jin Hyok. In the, the Russian election hacking case, there's a, a, an indictment out against, I think, 12 uh, Russian members of the GRU, the Russian Military Intelligence Unit. Are these people ever going to get nicked? Get put by? No, no, absolutely not. There's a guy called, um, I write about in the book, called Evgeny Bogachev, who's, he's like the Steve Jobs of cybercrime. He's an incredible character, and he's, he's behind a lot of the sort of innovative behavior in cybercrime. He really is a sort of touchstone figure. Evgeny Bogachev is on the US cyber most wanted list and has been there for 10 years ish, maybe a bit less. Um, is he ever going to get nicked or, or prosecuted? Almost certainly not, because he's probably never going to leave, leave Russia again. So the problem that law enforcement have is, for me, the backstop to a lot of his behavior is putting people behind bars. You know, actually people being deprived of their liberty is, whether you like it or not, a very strong disincentive for people to stop doing things. And in cybercrime, in a lot of cases, law enforcement themselves are quite prosaic in saying, well, we're never going to nick this person. So I'd say, yes, the FBI have been learning lessons. I've been impressed with what they've been, they've been putting out. But we've got to be realistic about our chances of, 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 of nicking some of these guys in whichever country they're in. Cool, thank you. Um, can you talk about how the dark web, web works in a yeah. lot of areas? Yeah, yeah. The, the, so the dark web is a really interesting piece of technology. Um, it was invented, amazingly enough, by, um, by the US Navy. Um, uh, a lot of people don't realize the US Navy wanted to use the internet, but in a way, the, the problem with the internet's got is the way the internet was built, first of all, is very bad at keeping secrets. Because when I visit the BBC website, my request for the BBC website goes along a number of intermediaries. So my internet provider, Virgin or whoever, sends the query to another company that sends it to another company that eventually it gets to the BBC's uh, website. Each of those companies along the way know that my IP address is visiting the BBC's website address. So it's quite bad at keeping it. So the, the, the Navy invented, the US Navy invented this way of, of, of managing to use that system, but never giving away your identity and never be able to connect who's visiting what website. Amazing piece of technology. Um, the problem with that piece of technology is it's like, an, it's like an invisibility cloak. It's like if you had a, a bright yellow invisibility cloak and you put it on and you're invisible. Wonderful. 
but then everybody's like why is the bright yellow invisibility cloak it's obvious that you're using it so what the us uh, government did was they went okay we need to share this as widely as possible so they shared it with a group called the electronic frontier foundation who are a civil liberties group in the us and obviously one of the things they do is fight censorship and this tool whilst it was also good for protecting spies identities is also really good for protecting the identity of people visiting. So if you're in China and you want to visit a, a you know, a, a size about Uyghurs, you might be able to use dark web technology and that might help you protect your identity. So for the spies, it worked, but also for the civil liberties guys, it worked. So the two of them sort of came together and launched this, uh, this piece of software. And it's, it's now freely available. It's open, openly available to download. The problem the dark web's got is you can use dark web technology to visit the BBC website or a controversial website if you're in a censorship, uh, a censorship environment. And it's great, that's great. You can also use that dark web technology to visit a series of hidden websites. And these web websites, if you try and visit them using Chrome or Firefox, they just don't appear, they, they just won't resolve a bit blank, blank page on your screen. But if you visit them using the dark web software, these websites reveal themselves to you. And that's where a lot of the, the criminal behavior goes on, the drugs, the guns, the child uh, sexual abuse and so on. So in a way, they've sort of created kind of Jekyll and Hyde situation where they're a great application of dark web technology, but they're sort of almost saddled with this other side of it, which, which is causing big problems. And weirdly, the US government having backed and bankrolled and financed this piece of technology is also now having to spend money fighting the crime that's actually coming off the back of it. It's uh, one, again, it's just one of these remarkable stories I tell in the book, uh, and, and it, it's one of these things you, the fact that there's not a film about the dark web and it's not been made into a sort of a, 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 a Hollywood film, I, I'm slightly huffy about. But anyway, the, the rights to my book are still available. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. Uh, so I think I'd like to ask the last question if no one else has got one. Sure. And um, so I've decided I've had enough of, of being an ethical charity, an ethical human charity. I would like to get into a life of cybercrime. How do I do it? <laughs> uh, first of all, I say don't. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's illegal and you'll almost certainly, uh, certainly get caught. Look, weirdly, a lot of the way that people, um, hmm, I think organized cybercrime is slightly different. So, so organized crime gangs, you know, will often recruit people, you know, through, through, their, through, through their own networks, a lot of sort of friends and family kind of connections there. Organized cyber, cyber crime gangs also recruit through computer forums. So again, you know, they'll go on the forum and say, hey, does anybody understand this piece of technology? And then somebody says, yes, I do. And they end up working, they might even not know they're necessarily working for a cyber crime gang. So there's a lot of that sort of behavior. The governments obviously recruit through universities and, and that kind of thing. But what's really interesting is there's a bunch of uh, particularly younger hackers and particularly male, it does skew quite male hacking, who got their break, who got their insight um, through computer gaming. Um, and there's some really interesting reasons for this. So game, computer games designers fill the games with um, little hacks, little tricks. You know, if you press five buttons at once, you can just walk through walls in a computer game. And obviously in a computer game, that gives you a huge advantage. Sometimes these are inadvertent. Sometimes if you if you run at the wall and press the keys all at once, you can get through it. And the games designers didn't deliberately design it like that. It's just, you know, it's a quirk of the game. So gamers do loads of work around this. They also are constantly trying to hack the games and change the games to get better results. Some gamers I've spoken to have had an experience where an opponent they were up against was unassailably good, just had, had brilliant skills. And they realized it's because this person had hacked the game or hacked the server or whatever. So gamers just get the hang of this of like, hmm, maybe if I do that, maybe if I go around this way, and that's the spirit of hacking, the soul of hacking is, is thinking differently. They don't look at a website like we look at a website. They look at it and go, how can I break it? How can it where, you know, if I press five keys all at once on the keyboard, what's the website going to do? That's gaming. That's a computer gaming thing. The other thing it does is um, when gamers work together, you know, often these games will be played online. You'll be playing with thousands of other people. They get very good at spotting who else is in the game and working together so they'll they'll see three other people that they've played the game with before and they'll message them and team up and say right let's all attack this particular target and it teaches you to kind of swarm together around a key objective a common objective with a bunch of people you've never met and you trust each other only as far as you need to to achieve that objective and then you just disband again small hacking teams have done this you know they, they all swarm around breaking into this particular institution do it have a laugh and then sort of scatter so you know i guess if i'm going to give you any advice it would be get into computer gaming but for goodness sakes don't don't get into cybercrime that's not uh, common that's not a good route 
<laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, that was absolutely fascinating. And uh, yeah, just given us loads and loads to think about. <laughs> Um, so uh, thank you everyone for joining, for those of you who are still here. Um, we've got our next talk is on rebearding on Wednesday the 23rd with Kerry Andrews talking about her book Wanderers. Uh, there's details for that on our website. Uh, the next Thinking on Sunday is uh, at the moment is on the 27th of September where we've got Dr. Kat Arney talking about her latest book Rebel Cell, A New View of Cancer. Um, you might know her from whole bunch of things. She's an award-winning science writer, consultant, t presenter, broadcaster, podcaster, public speaker, and harpist. Uh, also, all sorts of things. Brilliant woman. Um, so, yes, uh, thank you once again, Jeff. That was so, so interesting. Um, yeah, um, yeah, please keep us updated on how the book goes and if you're doing any more tours as well. Uh, you can follow Jeff on his Twitter, which was on the presentation before, uh, but otherwise there's details for that on our website. Buy, buy the book, absolutely buy the book. Uh, and everyone, yes, we'll see you soon. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks all. Have a good weekend. Bye.